Welcome to the Dissident Mama podcast. Today, my guest is Father Joseph Gleason. Uh, Father Joseph is a very busy man, so we're just going to jump right in and have him introduce himself, and then uh, we'll get into the interview. So welcome, Father. Today is the protection of the Theotokos. It's a blessed feast day, so I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Thank you. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. A blessed feast day to you as well. Thank you. So, um, you're a very busy guy. I alluded to that in the beginning. You are involved with quite a few websites. Let's see if I can get this straight and the things beyond websites. Um, Russian Faith. I will have all these links in the show notes, by the way. You are the editor. Correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Then you just recently started a new Substack called Moving to Russia. And it's Father Joe's newsletter, Moving to Russia, Escaping America and Western Europe. So that's pretty... Uh, out yeah. forward. Yeah, I like that. Very um, clear and concise. And then you are a contributor to the Russian Christian News Syndicate, which is also a substack. I, I believe it's orthodoxsubstack.com. And then Global Orthodox is another mm -hmm. one too. That is not um, a substack. That is gorthodox.com. So tell us about all those things, why you're involved with so many sites and what each is kind of doing to um, uh, push information in the faith forward. Oh, absolutely. So Russian faith, uh, as you said, I'm the editor of that website. And that started several years ago. And the idea behind the site is just there's so many good things happening in Russia, you know, just one out of a thousand things in 30 years uh, since the fall of communism, uh, Russia has built over 30,000 new churches, Orthodox churches. So that's literally one a day for 30 years, or I'm sorry, three a day for 30 years straight. And so, you know, nothing like that has ever happened in the history of the world. We've never had so many Orthodox churches just exploding over a country in such a short period of time. And yet, if you watch the Western news in America and Canada, Western Europe, you know, you'd think that it's always cold, it's always brutal, everybody's evil in Russia. You know, they don't really report the news, honestly. I was surprised there. And, and so the idea with Russian faith is just to point out uh, how powerfully the Orthodox Christian faith is truly impacting the culture here and really making a difference. And so we share all sorts of articles on there, uh, news, sermons, uh, just write-ups about things that are happening in the culture. And just, you know, some of it's just photos, just showing people photos of beautiful churches, beautiful monasteries, and showing people how the faith is really making a difference in Russia and impacting things. Um, now, the my sub stack that I started recently, that, um, the same sorts of things that I've been putting on the Moving to Russia substack, I've also put articles like that on Russian faith, but obviously this is more focused. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you're looking at Russian mm -hmm. faith, you want to know everything about what's going on in Russia spiritually. If you're looking at my uh, Moving to Russia substack, uh, that's really more focused on people that are looking at, look, things are going bad in the West. Uh, people are actually moving to Russia. They're leaving America, leaving Canada, leaving England, and they're moving to Russia. Um, why are they doing this? Some people are interested because they want to do it themselves. Other people just think it's really interesting that people are doing All right, Father Joseph and I got rudely interrupted by technology. He had been talking about Russian faith, um, that website where I have been cross-published before, and it's a take on um, all sorts of things, kind of a holistic approach to faith and geopolitics and things like that. And he was now telling us about his newsletter on su Substack, excuse me, Moving to Russia. Pick up where you left off, Father. Yeah, the Moving to Russia Substack, I publish a lot of things on there that I would also put on Russian faith, but this particular website is more focused. So um, instead of just talking about spirituality in Russia in general, I'm really focused on this, um, this movement, you know, this uh, phenomenon where multiple families are moving from, from America, from England, from Canada, from Brazil, from Denmark, from all over the world, coming to Russia and basically just trying to escape America, escape the West. 
And so that there's one place that people can go to really focus on this issue, whether they're wanting to do it themselves or whether they have family members that are doing it or whether they're just interested in the idea and they want to know why people are doing this. The whole idea of the moving to Russia Substack is that it's a place where we can talk specifically about that. You also have, I believe there's a page on Russian faith with moving to Russia stuff. So I want to uh, find out why you went to Russia personally. But before, let me give you the first devil's advocate question that people give you, give me when I've talked about possibly fleeing the West mm -hmm. <laughs> and then um, maybe settling down there or maybe just going for a few years where, while the civil war breaks out and then coming back to help clean up. That's always an option too. Um <laughs> uh you know aren't they still communists there putin was in the kgb i mean why would you go to a place where they love communism so much you know uh, it's this whole thing this whole cold war mentality um i think uh before maybe the last year or two well america's not that bad you know th these things will never happen here all the things that people have said would never happen have since unfolded and we're like hurtling off the cliff as we speak. Um, so how do you answer those questions, especially like the, oh, you know, Putin was in the KGB and they're all just a bunch of commies there. Well, uh, George Bush was in the CIA and they're all just a bunch of commies there. So, <laughs> yes. I mean, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you know, if we want to get into people's, uh, you know, pasts and, and look at a laundry list of those things. Let's, you know, let's start with the current president and his son. We can have a long conversation just on that. Yeah. But I'm more interested in, even though I am interested in where the country itself is going and, and what's going on politically, and I think that's important. I think the first question should always be is, you know, where's the church going? Uh, where are the spiritual people in a country going? Even, you know, look at a, at a horrible, you know, worst case scenario like Sodom and Gomorrah in scripture, even then, what did the Lord say? If I can just find a number of people there that are righteous, that are holy, that are doing what's right, then I'm going to have mercy. Uh, you know, it, it's less about what the wicked are doing and more about what are the righteous doing? You know, are they being faithful? Are they growing in number? Are they reaching out? Are they doing what they're sent there to do? Or are they just, uh, you know, taking on water into the boat are they basically compromising with the culture and you know granted there are many nominal christians in both russia and america okay so we're gonna pick back up with father right. joseph we have some uh, gremlins going on here tech gremlins you were talking about um nominal christians uh in america and in russia yeah, absolutely. Uh, people are always asking me, well, in America, we have a lot of nominal Christians. We have people that say they're Christians, but they're fake. And then we have really serious about ones. And what do you have in Russia? And I tell people it's basically the same here as it is there. Uh, you know, the only big difference in Russia is that, let's say, you know, 98 percent of all Christians are Orthodox. So that includes the, the nominal ones that never show up to church or only show up on, at Easter and Christmas. Uh, but it also includes, you know, millions upon millions of very serious Orthodox who very regularly go to church and pray and go on pilgrimages. Uh, so, you know, a big difference, of course, is that, you know, maybe you have, what, 1% of the American public that's Orthodox and a fraction of that that's really serious. Uh, whereas in Russia, you have maybe 70, 80 percent of the entire population, so maybe 80 to 100 million Orthodox. And then, um, you know, out of that, if even a small percentage are serious and devout, that's still millions and millions of people that are going on cross processions, that are going to church, that are praying and really taking the faith seriously. Right. And I love the way you phrased it earlier. It's not what the wicked are doing. It's what the righteous are doing. So, yes, y'all definitely uh, yeah. have us beat over there with numbers of uh, mm -hmm. faithful Orthodox, <laughs> for sure. And, then the, and then of course, there's an overlap because if the righteous are doing what they're supposed to do, then they throw out this, you know, this modernistic, stupid idea of separation of church and state and they get involved. You know, they mm -hmm. actually do something in the culture and in politics. And so just for example, just something fresh off the press is something new that's happening here now. Um, not only is Russia outlawing 
uh, homosexual propaganda for minors, okay. as it has done for many years uh, nationwide. But now uh, they're seriously pushing through a law uh, here in Russia that will outlaw homosexual propaganda for adults also. And I think that's huge. You know, that's and, really exciting. And explain to us what that means. Does it mean no representation of the rainbow in media and books? I mean, like across the board. I mean, tell us what that means, because we hear that in the West, but we're I don't know what it, that would look like. Right. So <clears throat> what they're not doing is they're not outlawing, uh, you know, the illicit activity itself. So. Okay. You know, if two filthy people want to go off in a dark room and do something, they don't want to know about it, and neither do I. Uh, so, you know, they're not uh, they're not doing surveillance for that types of thing. But what they don't want is they don't want to make it publicly acceptable. So you're corrupting minds with it. Okay. And, and if you think about it, um, it's not all that different from how most countries in the world were up until you know less than a century ago. Um, you know, since almost the beginning of time, there have been godless people that have done godless things and gotten away with it. But for most of human history, it's not been publicly acceptable. So, uh, you know, that's for, for, here's a perfect example, gay pride parades. Uh, those are prohibited. You don't see those in Russia. Uh, people apply for them, they try to do them, and then the government, not the church, but the government will shut it down and say, no, you're not going to do this because this would violate the federal law against uh, propaganda for minors because a child might be outside, they might see this parade go by and it might make them think, oh, uh, rainbows and fun and parades, maybe homosexuality is fun, maybe it's okay. Uh, well, obviously it's not, it's filthy, it's destructive. Uh, it's something very bad for society and very bad for the human soul. And so uh, we don't want that in parades. We don't want that uh, flashed in front of us on the TV screen. We don't want that, uh, you know, we don't want uh, some man in a tutu sitting at the library reading to children, you know, we don't want this kind of thing. Uh -huh. And so all they're doing now is they're just taking the next step and saying, not only is that type of propaganda detrimental to children, it's detrimental to everybody. We don't really want to promote that publicly at all. If somebody does it in private and we don't hear about it, nothing's going to happen to you. But if you start publicly trying to promote it on social media, publicly trying to promote it with parades and things like this, that's what the government's wanting to shut down. And I, I completely agree with it. Right. And you had said the whole separation of church and state there, where people think this is enshrined in U.S. founding documents, which it is not. Um, it was mentioned by Thomas Jefferson in a private letter to the Danbury Baptists, and he was just saying that they were actually concerned uh from what i know about it with um other types of christianity coming in and they wanted a wall of separation to protect them because there were state religions in the early colonies mm -hmm. here so this is this whole yeah thomas jefferson was not arguing for transgender librarians right. or anything like this and people think that this is like part of the first amendment and that's part of the problem here too is people don't know their history but another thing too is you know we have moral very christian um ethics embedded into our laws all over the place here right why do why is murder Absolutely. against the law why is stealing against the law so um you know if you really look at it from a overarching ideological perspective or a worldview perspective it makes total sense you know privacy of your own home it's not a muslim country they're not killing homosexuals you know keep it um in, in your own private purview but out in the public square it's something different i mean to me that makes total sense but it is just shocking to american sensibilities um what it, what is it like for the russians there who may be pro-western or think all the glitter and rainbows is super cool you know what what is it like there is it really just well just go ahead and tell me what is it like man on the street especially with younger people yeah absolutely so uh there's really a mix i would say the vast majority of russians are are heartily approving of of these laws uh you know seriously it's really interesting even the 
even the Russians who are just nominal, they say, yeah, yeah, I was baptized, I'm Orthodox, but I never go to church, or I almost never set foot in a church. Maybe they live in very worldly ways most of the time. Uh, even most of these Russians, uh, they're just disgusted by the very idea of homosexuality, which is a good thing. You know, it's something that is disgusting. It's something that has disgusted most people, you know, for most of history. This is normal to be disgusted by this. Um, and so most Russians, they don't want it. They don't want to have anything to do with it. Now, you said among the young. So it's interesting. I've met a number of young people who are very devout, very religious, uh, <clears throat> you know, I've met I've met young people that are saying you know we want we want to have an Orthodox Christian czar again we want an Orthodox you know Christian empire again, um, but of course there's also some very liberal universities and there are some young people that watch you know hor horrible things on TV in Russian, you know maybe it's stuff from America and it has Russian subtitles but they're still watching this stuff, and so of course you have some uh, you have some very liberal youth as well that want everything to be just like the west just like america and so this subset of people um you know they're horrified by you know any kind of quote unquote repression of homosexuals uh just like a lot of people in america are but you know just overall from a statistical perspective the vast majority not only of russians but just of slavic countries in general and even Eastern Europeans in general are very much anti-LGBT, anti-homosexual. And uh, America, meanwhile, I was actually really horrified by what I was reading recently. Um, it, it's been a radical shift in the wrong direction just over the past few years. So you rewind even 20 years. And still, even though um, they weren't where Russians are today, still the, the majority of Americans were opposed the homosexuality to homosexual quote unquote marriage. Um, and the most recent Gallup polls that I was looking at, it was something like 71% of Americans are now in favor of this abomination. So the propaganda has done its job. You know, it's really, it's really worked. And I, I looked at a more granular level in America and I wanted to see, you know, what about specific states? You know, what if you're in Missouri? What if you're in Kansas? And I was even more horrified. Uh, 48 of the 50 states in America are now majority supporting homosexual marriage. And so I think the only two that were still majority opposing it were Alabama and um, I forget what the other state was, but there were, there, were only two, there were only two states that actually had a majority of people not supporting homosexual marriage in America. And so this is what Russia does not want to see. They don't want to let the propaganda do its work. They want to cut that off before that happens here. Right, because, uh, you know, the question is, do the politics push culture or the cult culture push politics? And I think it's both. And yeah, yeah. to get out in front of this. Um, so I, I've heard also that Russia is blocking some of the world's largest free porn sites. Um that, you know, this would be a, a First Amendment, you know, travesty in America, but it's like, no, it's uh, <laughs> something they want to get ahead of the curve. Is is that true about the uh, blockage of those sites? I believe they have blocked a number of them. Um, I wish they would block them all. <laughs> so, you know, obviously people that want to get to that kind of stuff, they can get to it. Uh, just as you have VPNs available in America, yeah. there are also VPNs that people get here and they get around some of these blockings. But, but yes, the, the, absolutely, they have blocked a lot of things like that here. Uh, they don't want it. They don't want it available for people. And, and honestly, for people that raise that argument, I say if the best that you can do with the First Amendment is to mm -hmm. vote for porn, then let's get rid of the First Amendment because we don't need it then if that's what it's yep. for. You know, uh, That's not what they wrote the First Amendment for. And the people who actually pinned the Bill of Rights, I think 100% of them would have thrown you in jail for trying to produce mm -hmm. pornography. So it's just a really bad argument. Yeah, absolutely. The founders were assuming this American experiment was going to be um, with virtuous people. And we have yes. definitely gone astray from that. Tell us a little bit about, okay, so uh, your average American may be listening to this and thinking, well, the government doesn't have the right to do that or this or that, you know, tell us about like the, um, the double-headed eagle and how there can be 
um, the church and state working together as like a balance mm -hmm. and like symphonia and why this to many people outside of the West is not seen as tyranny or oppression. It's just something that makes sense. Can you parse that out for us? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's really as simple as just building a government in the way that Christ commanded to do it. I mean, it, it's, it doesn't have to be much more complex than that. Um, you know, you start giving any examples from the Old Testament and people like to shut you down and say, oh, you know, this is theonomy or this is, uh, you know, theocracy. And they use all these, you know, scare quotes and everything. But, um, you know, let's just back up and say, was God trying to teach us anything at all? You know, are we supposed to, as Christians, should we just ignore everything that he did whenever he set up a nation and he gave it its laws? Is that irrelevant to us, you know? <laughs> And and you ask it in that way, and you realize it's foolish to ignore that. It's foolish, you know. If God Himself set up a nation and God Himself gave it laws, surely we can glean something of use from that. And and what and what do we see when God did that? Well, uh, first of all, He did it as a monarchy. I think ideally that's what we should have. You know, even better than uh, you know having. A president of a country, I think it would be better to have a monarchy. Uh, we don't have that at this time in Russia or in America, but I think that would be ideal. But, you know, aside from that, how should the country be run? Well, with, with Israel, God said, okay, a new person becomes king. What are the requirements for this man who is going to lead this entire nation? And one of the requirements that's given in scripture breathed by the Holy Spirit, is that the king is supposed to take uh, the scriptures, however much of, you know, scripture had been written by that point, and he was supposed to write it out by hand. So imagine if somebody, you know, you become the president of the country, and somebody hands you a Bible, an orthodox study Bible, of course, and you take that Bible, and your first requirement as president of the United States, or president of Russia, is to take a pen and a big stack of paper and word for word, you have to write out the entire Bible by hand. That's your first step. Uh, second step, as long as you are ruling the country, you have to take that copy of the Bible that you wrote out yourself and set it beside you and you must read it daily. Now, if we did nothing else that God said, and God said hundreds and hundreds of things, but if we did nothing else, if we just required every new leader of the country to write out the entire scriptures by hand and then to read from those scriptures daily thereafter, just that right there might help a lot. <laughs> it might do a lot of good for whatever country is being run in such a way. And one thing it teaches us is God wants leaders of nations to consult the scriptures daily. And what's implied there is that they're going to run the country the way that God says to do things. They are going to take their faith and they're going to live it out in the way that they run the country. And if you look closely at what Christ and the apostles say in the New Testament, uh, this is actually absolutely coherent and it fits together because in the New Testament, we're told to take every thought captive to Christ. Now think about what that means. Every thought captive to Christ. That means every thought that you have about politics, every thought that you have about law, every thought that you have about justice, every thought that you have about uh, equality or democracy or monarchy or how to run a country, literally every thought you have, you're supposed to submit that to Christ. And what that means is to obey Christ in every area of your life. And so how does that possibly fit with the concept of separating church and state? Right. Now, obviously, we don't want to so combine them that, you know, the priests or bishops are the ones passing the laws. That, that's, that would be a different problem. But if we're simply talking about faith and applying one's faith in the public sphere, absolutely every politician should not only be allowed, but should be required to have a copy of the Holy Scriptures and to at least make an effort to apply what they learn there to what they're doing in the public square. Right. And um, 
the double-headed eagle, that would be the balance. That's the church on one side and the state on the other. Um, Absolutely. And, and um, it's, it's that word, uh, uh, symphonia, yeah. you know, symphony. And the idea being, you know, just like you have different instruments playing in a symphony, but they're playing in harmony and it sounds yes. good. Uh, the double-headed eagle, of course, uh, you know, we see that earlier in uh, Byzantium, and I hate calling it that, but the Eastern Roman Empire the Orthodox empire in, uh, in the East that lasted for 1100 years. Um, you know, that, that came from there to Russia. And the idea then, just as it is now, is that you'd have, like you said, the two eagles. So the one is the church, uh, the sphere of faith, the sphere of, you know, what are God's commands? What does he want us to do? Um, how does he prepare our souls for heaven? And the other sphere, which is the state, is that second head, but they're not two separate eagles fighting with each other or ignoring each other. It's it's one eagle with you know two heads, and they work together, you know, in cooperation and symphony. And you had said the M word, monarchy, which freaks out a lot of people in these parts. And uh, my 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 retort to them would be, you know, this democracy you all love so much that is not mm -hmm. even supposed to be a thing um, is is a train wreck. So, you know, the onus should be on you to <laughs> defend democracy, which is undefensible because it is, like yeah. I said, it's a train wreck. So, um, you know, how do you explain, um, is there anything else you would tell people who are, you know, think democracy and individualism would be, um, well, obviously democracy would be squashed and needs to be, but like individuality would be squashed within a monarchy. You know, they think about um, serfdom and peasantry and, you know, kings living on high and, um, you know, absolutism and things like that. Uh, how, how would you address that? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an excellent question. It's, it's understandable, especially considering that, you know, while, while in Russia, you know, Russia has been here more than a thousand years and the vast majority of that time it's been Christian and the vast majority of that time it's been a monarchy. It's been ruled by kings. So here it's just part of the history, even though there's not currently a king of Russia or an empire. Uh, it's just part of, you know, it's just part of what Russia is. It's, you know, it's historically Christian. It's historically a monarchy. Uh, America, obviously, is totally different. You know, if we look at the founding as being 1776. Uh, from day one, you know, it's a nation founded on rebellion against monarchy. So, you know, the very ethos in how America was founded was, uh, you know, was vastly different. And people ask, you know, what's the, what's the number one thing I always get asked that people always bring up when I talk about monarchy? They say, well, what if you get a bad king? What if you get an evil king, right? You know, if you have somebody evil in power, uh, right now. bad things are going to happen, right? And so... <laughs> You know, look in America, you know, I mean, you know, thankfully, democracy keeps America from having evil people in power, right? That, right. That, that, that solves the problem, great. doesn't it? Yeah, we're and doing so, great here. <laughs> and so what I tell people is this. Uh, in a monarchy, you risk being ruled by the wicked. In a democracy, you guarantee it. I like it. Yep. Because in a democracy, the very idea, you know, or some people want to be persnickety and say, it's not a democracy, it's a republic. And, right. I, you know, we can have that conversation later. But either way, the idea in a democracy or in a republic is that you place governmental authority and power in the hands of citizens. And, and I do understand the difference between a democracy and a republic. But just Cliff's notes, you're putting governmental power in the hands of, of, of citizens. And when you do this, um, you know, what are the chances that 100% of them are going to be righteous? The chances are 0%. <laughs> you know, you're even in the greatest country that's ever been, you're going to have a certain percentage that are godless, that are wicked, that are turned away from God. And so if you say everybody in society must have a voice in the government, you're guaranteeing that at least a portion of your government is going to be wicked. Mm -hmm. And wicked has a way of spreading like cancer. Um, if you have a monarch, it's actually possible to have a good one. Now, are you always going to get a good one? No, you're not, unfortunately. Uh, sadly, you're usually going to get the one you deserve. So the, the more godly the people are, the godlier the monarch will be. Uh, the more lazy and wicked the people are, you know, the rougher their king's going to be. But 
you know, be that as it may, uh, you actually can get a good king. And people say, well, give me an example. You know, tell me one that's been really good. Uh, there's this great uh, book that came out years ago. You've probably seen it. Seen it. Um, what is it? Uh, Righteous Kings and Right Believing Queens, something like that. And it's literally, you know, it's like, I don't know, four or 500 pages thick. It's this big old tome. And what it is, it is a list of all of the Orthodox saints over the past 2000 years who have been royalty, kings, queens, princesses, princes, you know, duchesses and so on. And it's just page after page after page. There have been literally hundreds and hundreds of kings and queens who have not only been good, but they've been so good that they've been canonized by the church as saints. So, you know, numerous times in history, uh, there have actually been saints, <laughs> actual saints running a nation. And the only reason most people don't know about that is because people are lazy and they don't study history. Mm -hmm. And so they're just unaware of it. Um, and so on the side of monarchy, I put this book and I say, here's all the good kings and queens, the really good ones, the ones that have been canonized saints. And now let's say we wrote a second book. And it's all the democratically elected uh, presidents uh, in America and the West that have been canonized as saints. Um, how many pages would that book be? You know, it depends on how many blank Three. pages you want because <laughs> yeah. there haven't been any you know, it's, you know, big, big goose egg, it's zero. So that's the kind of argument I would bring forth is, you know, wh where's the fruit? You can argue all day long, but where is the fruit? Wh what's mm -hmm. the fruit of democracy? versus what is the fruit of monarchy and and i'll take the countries that are run by saints before the ones that are run by anything but right and um i think one of the mistakes with monarchy is thinking it is absolutism but there uh there are levels of um accountability within those systems that i think people forget about and looking to history you can see some of those and then um my retort to them would be also um we do have a king and we have royalty here. You know, we that's what centralization has done in America. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, we already yes, have that here. So what are you complaining about, right? <laughs> it's King Biden just by another name. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, let me talk about uh, young people. I have a, another couple of questions about that on the ground stuff, and then we'll pivot to something else. Um, Tim Kirby, I had watched an interview with him uh, with the Russian vlogger, Ellie from Russia, and he was talking about um, Russian women and how mm -hmm. you have to be careful with them as, you know, possibly being gold diggers. You know, here we are, you know, especially those of us in the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, we think of these traditional gals going to church and they're going to, they want to be wives and, you know, um, submit to their husbands and they're just, you know, pure as the driven snow. Well, mm -hmm. um, what would you say about the young women inside and outside of the church in Russia? Uh, is it something to be careful about if you were to move there as a young man, or is it just the way it is everywhere? You got to be careful just because you're dealing with human beings. Yeah, well, I mean, to a great extent, it's, the, it's like it is everywhere. Sadly, um, you know, whereas Russia is head and shoulders above America and the West when it comes to the whole question about lgbt and transgender and that kind of thing when it comes to just you know sadly good old-fashioned divorce fornication these types of problems russia has it just as bad as america so um you know if you're looking to escape a culture where there's a lot of divorce or escape a culture where there's a lot of you know premarital cohabitation uh you know it's, it doesn't get any better be, just because you go from america to russia they really have a bad problem with both of those things here as well um, but that shouldn't make anybody hopeless. Certainly outside the church, it's the worst, you know, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of cohabitation, a lot of people, you know, not, not trying to, not making any effort to be pure before marriage, uh, within the church, uh, it's more hopeful. Now it, it's a mix there because you have both nominal Christians and serious Christians in the church, but, you know, where I've been most impressed, surprise, surprise is, uh, find priest daughters now the good the thing is in america you have to drive a couple hundred miles in between priest houses you know <laughs> right. uh, here you know here you throw a rock and and you hit three priests you know it's just <laughs> they're everywhere you know 
uh, I mean, just to put things in perspective, I, I don't know the exact number, but I think in Russia, there's over 300 bishops. <laughs> so, wow. or, or to put it in a little, you know, a little, a little smaller perspective, you know, think about a state in, in America, a state like Texas or Florida or Oklahoma. Uh, in Russia, we call it an oblast. Mm -hmm. but think of it as a state. And in the state of Yaroslavl, which is the state where I happen to live, um, just in this one state, there are three different bishops. Wow. And, and so, you know, one bishop, there are so many Orthodox churches, so many Orthodox priests that you can't even have one bishop per state. He just wouldn't be able to handle the load. It's just too many churches and monasteries. Um, so my bishop, uh, the one who received me uh, in the Moscow Patriarchate, he's over Paraslavl and Uglich and also Borsoglebsky. And just in this one third of the state, uh, he visits something like 150 churches and 10 monasteries you know, throughout the year. He does something like 200 hierarchical divine liturgies a year. He's wow. a very, very, very busy bishop. And that's just one third of the state. So, um, you know, you can just drive half an hour and find multiple Orthodox priests, multiple Orthodox priest families. And so, you know, if somebody's wanting to come to Russia to find a godly Orthodox spouse, that's not a bad idea. I would just say the same thing here that I'd say in America, and that's go to the church. Don't go to don't be stupid and go to nightclubs and bars and places like that. If you fish in the mud, you're only going to get a catfish. Right. You're not going to get a rainbow trout. You know? um, same thing. If you only go to the bars and clubs and dances and stuff, you're going to get church. But if you're willing to go to the church, if you're willing to get involved with the choir, if you're willing to meet the priests and the priest families and get to know their daughters and their sons, um, then you have a really, really good chance of meeting somebody that's quality. So again, it's uh, just upping the odds because of the numbers. Uh, one exactly. More, one more question about uh, like a pushback that I've gotten when I've you know said like pro-Russian things before and about Russia being traditional, being mm -hmm. on the ascent, uh, faith-wise and such. Um, but abortion, oh, you know, they just have abortion coming out of their ears. You know, the the skeptics scream it. Um, I try to explain. I mean, under communism. That was pretty much birth control, right? Is, is abortion. Mm -hmm. And so they're just digging themselves out of that um, to where we want to double down and say it's great, you know, and the states here are going nuts about, you know, um, the Supreme Court ruling and all this kind of thing after 40 years of it. Uh, Russia's doing the opposite. They're pivoting toward life, whereas we're pivoting toward death. So um, what do you know about that? Like the numbers with abortion, are they going down? Is the government trying to, um, I don't know, encourage people to pursue adoption or what What when they do get married, I mean, get pregnant um, and they're not married? Right, absolutely. So yeah, that's where you have, just like you said, you have to look at it in context. So you have to realize that this country was uh, being oppressed by communism and by communists for 70 years. And, that, and that's really bad, you know, kind of like the, kind of like when Israel was carried off to Babylon for 70 years, that was a really rough time. Uh, it was a rough time here. And during that time, you have a, ha, had a government that was atheistic and that mocked the church and, and destroyed most of the churches in the country and imprisoned a lot of its own people. And, you know, surprise, surprise, people got very depressed, people got very desperate, uh, a lot of people lost hope, and <clears throat> they also didn't have access to a lot of the things that, you know, other parts of the world had access to, and you're right, during that period of time, that very dark period of time, the primary form of birth control for most Russians was abortion, and so it got to be really, really, really bad. There were actually more abortions than births you know, some of the years in, the, in wow. the Soviet Union. So that was horrific. That was bad. That's what we would expect from an atheist state. Uh, but communism fell 30, more than 30 years ago. You know, 1991, there's no more communism. You know, Russia is no longer a communist country. It's uh, 31 years now. It's been a uh, you know, been a, a constitutional, you know, they've got their own constitution, people go to elections, they vote for their leaders. And 
uh, anyway for for decades now. It's not just a pivot within the last two or three years. Literally for decades now, the abortion numbers have just been plummeting, going down, 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 down every single year. Just uh, you know, they're vastly lower than they were ten years ago. Vastly lower than they were twenty years ago. And so they still have they still have a ways to go. You know, we, we still would like to see the numbers come down a lot more. Um, but whereas, you know, in the 70s and 80s, you know, abortions were in the millions. Uh, now you know, it's less than half a million. It's in, you know, a few hundred thousand. That's still too many. No question. That's mm-hmm. still too many. But uh, if you look at a graph of it, they've very consistently just been, you know, the numbers have been vastly going down. And it didn't just happen on its own. The federal government, you know, not just local governments, you know, there's no concept of red states or blue states. Uh, the Russian federal government has been working to, uh, you know, to limit abortions in various ways. So in, in Russia, if you want to get an abortion, you can't just go get one. You have to, uh, you have to get a, a ultrasound. You know, you have to at least be given the opportunity to see that there's a life in there. You know, there's a heartbeat. Uh, and then you have to take a few days to contemplate, to think about it, and hopefully change your mind. And they've been able to show that at least a, a, a significant percentage, you know, not a majority, unfortunately, but a significant percentage of those who do this uh, decide they don't want an abortion after all. And so they keep the baby. So it's, it's having some real life effects and bringing you know, more children into the world. Also, um, now that communism has fallen and that this sort of thing is allowed, uh, there are friends of mine, uh, you know, Father Maxim Obukov, for example, he's a priest with eight children in Moscow, and he's, you know, for years now, he's been spearheading the uh, uh, crisis pregnancy centers in Russia. So yeah. something that you've seen in America for years to combat abortion, they have it right here in Russia now. They're putting crisis pregnant, the Orthodox Church is putting crisis pregnancy centers in, you know, major cities all over Russia, uh, giving women a place to call, a place to go, a place to look for help, uh, where they're not going to treat you differently based on what your beliefs are or your religion or your past or anything. They're just going to say, look, you know, you, you have a precious baby inside of you. We want to help you. We want to help you bring that baby into the world. We want to help make sure that you and the baby are taken care of. And, and that too is helping to bring more lives into the world. And that's contributing to these numbers going down. Right. And the the numbers, the loss of life uh, during both world wars for the Russian people was astronomical and then put on top Mm -hmm. of that Soviet communism. And it's not just, um, I guess, unwed mothers who have abortions. Sometimes married women do, too. And Russia has like pro large family policies. Um, uh, See if you can explain that in just a minute or two before we take our break, Father. What are they doing to encourage that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in Russia, if you have uh, seven children or more, uh, you become eligible for uh, winning an award from the president. So every year, uh, you know, the president of Russia, Putin, will pull a family with eight children, 15 children, however many, and that he wow. considers exemplary. And he will actually, on, you know, on in front of the TV cameras, he will give them an award saying, you are good parents. You are setting a good example you know, we want to see more of this in Russia. So they really, really honor uh, multi-child families and they, they place a priority on it. They also have a lot of federal programs to like help with utility bills and to help uh, sometimes with car bills and things like that. So that, uh, so that big families, there's also a lot, thousands of dollars that they give parents whenever they have additional children. Right. So just a lot of incentives that they give to say that it, they really want to encourage this. Right. And again, the opposite of America, we pay people to have abortions here. You know, now companies are doing that, flying people to out of state so they can Mm -hmm. sit in their cubicle and be all liberated and such. Or, you know, paying um, single moms to have babies with no dads. So, I mean, the complete polar opposite, you know, so uh, somebody in America may get upset. Oh, the government's getting involved. Well, they're getting involved here, but for the opposite reasons. You know, it's anti-family here and pro-family there. I just think that is, um, that's a it's really, mm-hmm. if you're going to be spending the money, it should be the way Russia's doing it, in my opinion. Um, exactly. Okay, so we're going to take a little break and then we're going to come back and find out why you're in Russia and all the stuff you're doing to encourage others to move to Russia. So all I right. will see you in just a second, Father, and um, be right back. 
Okay, welcome back, Father. Uh, yeah, you had recently written an article called How the Russian Church Positively Influences the Russian Government, which is what we've been talking about, but mm -hmm. that was for Global Orthodox. Um, tell us a little bit about that website before we find out a little bit more about you. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. Uh, it's actually been around for a little while. Uh, it's actually based in mm -hmm. Russia. So there's a, a Christian nonprofit group that started this website a while back in Moscow and they publish in four languages so they publish in russian ukrainian greek and english mm. and anyway a, a little while back they called me and they saw the work that i've done with the russian faith website and they just asked you know can you help us can you help us you know take a look at some things on here improve this on the site improve that and so i've done some consulting work for them and i've contributed some articles to the site as well and the more I look at it, I just I feel like it's really one of the better uh, Orthodox Christian news sites that's out there. Uh, it's just really interesting. You know, if you you know, there's a lot of sites out there. You can go to orthochristian.com. That's excellent. You know, the uh, Union of Orthodox Journalists has a number of good articles uh, from time to time. There's you know, a whole page full of blogs that we could reel off. But just news in the Orthodox Christian world, especially uh, as it pertains to, you know, as it pertains to Russia, things in Eastern Europe, uh, it's just really interesting. A lot of times the, some of the best news that I'll see come out, uh, some of the most interesting topics, um, I'll a lot of times see it pop up first on, you know, on Global Orthodox. And so, uh, you know, I'm not the one that started it. I don't run the site, but I've helped out with it. And I've really enjoyed a lot of the articles that I've seen on there. And so, um, I just I have a lot of good things to say about it. Um, you uh, have done quite a few videos, uh, written extensively about your move to Russia mm -hmm. and why you're there and how long you've been there. Can you give us um, just give listeners a primer? And I'll put uh, a lot of that stuff in the show notes page. But how long you've been there, why you went, uh, etc. Oh, absolutely. So like many people that I've talked to, um, I've just sensed for over a decade that there's there's something in the water, there's something in the air, there's something going on in the world that's uh, unpleasant. <laughs> and um, uh, just, you know, as a serious Christian who really likes to pay attention to, to spiritual things, um, you know, I, I lived in America for nearly 40 years and I could see things were just not going in the right direction. I could see that things were going badly in certain ways. And so I, I just, it got into the back of my mind. I know if you study history, that every empire falls. Doesn't matter how powerful you get, how strong you get. Um, every powerful country eventually deteriorates in some way and has crises, sometimes, you know, falls all the way. And uh, generally this coincides with a country, um, you know, falling into sin. You know, the more that a nation turns their back on God, God has mercy. He has grace. Uh, he sends a few wake-up calls, but eventually, you know, unfortunately, the, the day comes that God turns his back on that nation. And uh, I know that that can happen to America, just like it can happen to, to any nation on earth. And so just in the back of my mind, knowing that there are a lot of very troubling things going on, I thought, you know, what if this happened? You know, what if things just really went bad here? What would I do? Where, you know, where would I go? And it was just kind of an idea. I toyed around it with it in my head, but I didn't have any serious answers. And then one state after another in the U.S. started uh, legalizing this uh, this idea of homosexual marriage. You know, and I put scare quotes around it because there is no such thing. You know, the only marriage is that which God created, which is between one man and one woman. Uh, they call it marriage. And I know that the family is like one of the very cornerstones of society. Um, what happens in the household is ultimately going to be reflected in the entire nation. How you raise children uh, is, you know, who are you raising when you raise the kids? You're raising the future leaders of the nation, you know, the people who will be the doctors, lawyers, and politicians and presidents, you know, uh, uh, of the generation to come. 
And so if you completely destroy marriage, you completely destroy the home, you completely destroy any uh, Christian concept of what a family is, uh, you've not just given a great blow to Christians. You've not just given a great black eye to the church. Um, you've literally pulled the rug out from civilization itself. And whenever you pull the rug out from under something, whatever's on it falls down and it crashed on the ground. And so I, I found this just very alarming. You know, I don't like uh, the bad things in the media. Um, I don't like the, you know, let me mute this dumb thing. <laughs> um, I'll just uh, turn it off, actually. I don't like the bad things in the media. I don't like um, you know, a lot of the things that they've legalized, but, but this is different. This wasn't just one more sin. This wasn't just one more uh, filthy TV show or bad movie or bad court decision. Um, when you strike at marriage, when you strike at the family, you're striking at the very, very heart of what the civilization is founded on. And so where I really started thinking seriously about leaving America, not necessarily going to Russia, but just leaving America was whenever they started legalizing homosexual marriage in all these different states. And I said, if they ever go overboard so far that they legalize it nationwide, I said, we've got to get out of here. My family's not going to be safe. Maybe we'll be safe for another five or 10 years or 20 years. But I said, eventually, if our nation does not repent, uh, the judgment of God will fall. You know, Sodom and Gomorrah was... Uh, you know, Sodom was a city, but now it's a whole continent. <laughs> and I don't want to be on that continent when the judgment of God falls. And so it happened. It happened. Uh, you know, Obergefell versus Hodges happened in 2015. And that was the day. That was the final straw where I said, okay, it's not just theoretical anymore. Uh, we got to get out of here. And I applied for a Russian visa. And two months after that Supreme Court case, was the first time I visited Russia, starting to check it out and see, is this the sort of place that I would want to bring my family? Wow. And then in January, 2017, my wife and eight kids and I actually moved here. Uh, people always ask, why Russia? Why not some other country? And there's a re really simple answer to that. I looked at a lot of different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of countries in the world have homosexual marriage. So why would I want to go there? That would be out of the frying pan into the fire. Mm -hmm. Yes, I could go to France, I could go to England, I could go to Mexico, but they have, you know, they have the same rainbow flags and sodomites there. Uh, that doesn't help. Me. Uh, now, a lot of the countries where there is not gay marriage, they have forbidden homeschooling. So that's why I can't go to Greece. I can't go to Serbia. Yes, there's a lot of Orthodox there. Uh, yes, you know, there's not homosexual marriage, but I can homeschool my kids. And that's really important to me. And so just those two things alone, if you try to find countries that prohibit homosexual marriage, that do not have even civil unions, and also find a country that uh, where homeschooling is legal, uh, that really narrows it down to just Russia and very few other options. And then on top of that, a big plus for me, um let's say we went somewhere like chile let's say we went somewhere like uruguay or paraguay uh maybe everything would be fine for now but 10 years from now uh america finds out that they struck oil in that country or that there's some economic benefit to be had and so america sends its troops to liberate that country uh to overthrow its <laughs> to overthrow its leaders and then to turn it into a puppet state of america so that Monsanto can move in and so that, uh, you know, <laughs> so they can make sure that it's woke there, just like it is in America, and that you have LGBT everything. Um, most countries in the world would not be able to stand up against that. They wouldn't be able to resist the American military. Mm -hmm. But I looked at Russia and I said, you know what? The Russian military is superior to what America has. Uh, America is not going to try to invade Russia. And if they're stupid enough to try, they will fail. So I felt like the Russian military is strong enough to protect me from the American military. So that was a third reason. Right. Well, those are great reasons. It's uh, taking the things that you absolutely, you know, are vital 
to your mm-hmm. worldview and then just once you get like 99 percent of the other countries you can see obviously who it is and one of the things you know that is so frightening living in in america and raising children is the totalitarian nature of the wokeism it's not yes. about tolerance you know anymore no. and it's about affirmation it's about acceptance it's about mm-hmm. you will change you will bend the knee to whatever it is they and have their own blasphemy laws <laughs> yes so that's the thing you know uh wokeism is it, it wants to be global in nature the people who push it and they need foot soldiers so anybody who dissents on any part of it is deemed a heretic right and um, I think Globo Homo is such a great way to explain all mm-hmm. of this because it's not just globalism and homogenization. It's, you know, the homo as well, because that is the linchpin. That's the key for everything. So people who may hear a conversation and be like, oh, these homophobes, yada, yada, you know, it's it's because that is like the holy grail of wokeism, because if you can do that, you splinter everything, the family, faith. Mm -hmm. all the dominoes um, fall down for a traditional order so you wanted to flee the totalitarian wokeism um, which wasn't near as bad even 10 years ago so now um, you have written an article recently called escaping america when god says to flee so tell us where you're at today well today my uh, wife and eight children and i live uh just a few minutes west of Rostov the Great, which uh, there's two different Rostovs in Russia. There's a big yeah, Rostov that confused about me a, for a long a time. Million people down in southern Russia, and that's actually the new one. That Rostov was founded in the 1700s. It's only about 250, 300 years old. It's new. Oh, that's all. <laughs> but not 900 years before that, uh, you have uh, Rostov Veliki, Rostov the Great, and that's about uh, 125 miles north of Moscow, about 200 kilometers north of Moscow. And so that's where we came. And now we have our own farm, we have our own acreage, a uh, number of acres of land, and we're out in the country just a little bit west of that Rostov. Now, when you encourage people through your writings and your talks and such to come to Russia, um, are there programs set up? Um, Tim Kirby has been talking about this a little bit. I've heard you mention it before. Is the government getting involved to possibly help like Orthodox refugees if they're living in a place that they think is too totalitarian, um, wokeism wise? Um, what, when you show up, are the people to help you learn the language? Is there like a community there to embrace mm-hmm. you? Tell us all about that for somebody who may be interested. Oh, and of course, like the visa process and all that kind of thing. Um, give us the nuts and bolts of that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, and just by the way, you talked about, you know, you're talking about fleeing. Just as an aside, I, I get a real kick out of, you know, looking at some of the news articles, you know, with the whole military thing that's been going on between Russia and Ukraine lately. Uh, people have made a big deal about, oh, there's all these Russians that have been fleeing Russia and leaving Russia and going elsewhere. Well, it's the reverse. You've got a bunch of woke liberals, even though they're in the minority, there's still a number of woke liberals in Russia and they've been trying to get out of here. And so I like seeing them go. It makes me happy. I say, this is okay. great. You know? That's <laughs> go, a great go, question. Go I've where heard you of, wanted, you know? It's yeah, I've heard, of, <laughs> I've heard about the Russian refugees and I'm like, are they ethnic Russians living in Ukraine who are leaving? So this is what you're saying. It's just liberal Russians hitting the road. Yeah, it's a a lot of people I don't want in Russia anyway. So they're welcome to go and infect the countries where they're wanted. uh, (laughs) (laughs) To me, it's a plus, not a negative. But but anyway, um, yeah, so people that are sane and are coming the other direction. uh, um, Yeah, I mean, Russia is an amazing place. It has beautiful churches, beautiful people, uh, beautiful nature, has a lot of things that are wonderful, but the bureaucracy can be a bear. The bureaucracy. Uh, it's doable, obviously. You know, my, my family and I are Russian citizens now. Uh, so it's doable. But it's a lot of paperwork. You know, you, you got a lot of hoops to jump through, a lot of papers you have to sign. And, uh, and it makes sense. Um, they have to vet people. They have to feel like these people are going to 
you know, that they're not coming here to be terrorists, they're not coming here to cause problems, but that they actually love Russia and that they want to live here. And, uh, you know, worldwide, America is the number one destination for immigrants. The number two destination worldwide is Russia. Huh. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize, but so they have so many people wanting to immigrate to Russia, wanting to come here. Um, you know, they have to be careful. They have to, they have to look at everybody's, you know, background check and, uh, find out, you know, are you at least trying to learn Russian? Are you making mm -hmm. some progress so that you'll be able to communicate? And, um, uh, but yeah, so it's, it's a difficult process, but it's absolutely doable. And there's different ways to do it. Some people, uh, will come here as a student. And so they'll take some university classes, live here for a while, taking classes, going to a university, and then they'll realize they want to stay here. And then there's a process in which they'll, you know, they'll transition to becoming legal residents here. There's other, a lot of people just come here as tourists. Um, you know, most countries in the world, you can only get a 90 day visa, tourist visa to Russia. But for some unknown reason, uh, there's a really special opportunity. If you're an American, and it's crazy considering what's going on in the world right now, but you know, it's been this way for years. If you're an American and you get a Russian visa, it's a three-year three visa. Year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's just phenomenal. It means that it gives you time. <laughs> you know, make sure that you have saved up some money so that you'll be able to pay your bills the first few months. That you'll be able to pay your rent, uh, get your bearings, decide what you're going to do, what kind of work you're going to do. But it just buys you time. You don't have to spend huge amounts of money on plane tickets to fly back and forth and renew visas. You can just get one visa fly here and that visa is good for three years and uh and so a lot of people just come here from america on the tourist visa and once they start going through the paperwork and the process then eventually they transition over to becoming legal residents of russia uh, another path here is through a work visa you know if you come here um and you have you ahead of time you set it up so that you have a job teaching English, for example, that's very highly in demand. Uh, English is the business language of the world. And so there are millions of Russians uh, wanting to learn English. And so that's, you know, you can actually come here. You're not gonna get rich, but you can, you can make money uh, teaching English in Russian. That's what a lot of Americans do when they first come here. And if you do that, it opens the door because instead of just a tourist visa, you can come here on a work visa. And that gets you to re legal residency a lot faster. So that's another path. Um, and so I won't give the boring details about you know, exactly which pieces of paper you fill out and all the little tiny things that you do. I, I put a whole article about that on my Substack. stack. But um, I will say this, uh, you want the government's assistance with the process. Um, there are, like if you go to Moscow, Unless you're coming on a work visa, Moscow is one of the most difficult places to immigrate because they just have so many people trying to get in all the time. Mm -hmm. Same with St. Petersburg. Very, very difficult unless you're there on a work visa. Uh, but if you come here on a, on a student visa, you come here on like a tourist visa especially, you want somebody in the government that wants to help you through the process because not everybody who applies for residency gets in. You know, mm -hmm. uh, America has its Mexico, well, Russia has its Kazakhstan and China, you know, and there's people that are coming across the border just to be day laborers and, you know, trying to get residency and citizenship the same as, you know, Mexicans coming into Texas. And so, at least at this time, the, the Russian immigration um, service does not really differentiate between those people and, you know, people like me, you know, coming from America and, and, and wanting to bring our families to, you know, to a better place. And so to navigate that whole process, if you just fly here on your own and you go to some random location in Russia, you might succeed. You know, you, you also might win the lottery, but it's, uh, it's gonna be difficult. Um, the nice thing about the Yaroslavl Oblast, the Yaroslavl state where I live, is over the past few years, we've been able to make um, connections with the, the state government. You know, I've been able to talk to the governor, I've uh, been able to talk to some of his associates. And the nice thing is they've actually, you know, this associate to the governor, uh, this guy has actually come to visit us in our home. He's visited us, talked to us, visited several of the other American families that have come to this area. And he's just been very, very helpful. 
And uh, finally, there, there was enough interest from enough families. Um, and a lot of them, you know, they don't just want a small plot of land. They actually want like five acres, 10 acres, 20 acres of land to do some, you know, small farming on that we approached the Yaris level government and said, look, you know, we need a place where, you know, we, where we can, you know, at least be near each other, where we can get acreages, but still live near enough to each other that we can communicate and talk. And Yaris level really liked the idea. And so they started calling it the American village, <laughs> which I thought that's kind of cool, you know? Uh, uh, of course they said it in Russian, but uh, <laughs> they said, we like this idea. We want to start an American village. And so long story short, it took a lot of work, a lot of months of effort, but you know we've been able to secure a lot of land you know hundreds of acres of land in a in a very you know close area here uh right you know i live right in the middle of a lot of it and and this is where a number of families are coming they're buying land they're built you know planning to build houses in this area in the meantime they're you know getting other houses village houses not far from here and it's pretty exciting you know there's actually government support uh, you know, with the paperwork and with, you know, facilitating the process saying, look, if you come here, if, you, if you're a Orthodox Christian family, uh, you love Russia, you genuinely want to spend the rest of your life here, uh, you make good friends with these other Americans that have moved to this area, and they recommend you, you know, we're going to talk to you, we're going to meet you, and then we're going to help you. And, you know, I can't promise what's going to happen in the future, but I can at least say that up to this point, uh, a number of families have come here to this area and time and time and time again, the government continues to be very helpful in making sure that they're able to get through that immigration process successfully. So it's nice if, if you, you know, if somebody wants to move here and they like the idea of living out in the country or at least living in the Rostov area, they don't need to be in a big giant city, then, you know, this is a good place to come because you're not going to do it alone. You're going to have government contacts that are going to try to help you with your paperwork and you're also going to have multiple other orthodox christian families with kids um, living in the same general areas so you're going to have you know you're going to have expat americans to talk with as well as local russians yeah that was going to be my question this american village is it so american that it's not russian which would seem you know odd why to flee america and then just like create a little america there you know but is it taking the best of america and blending it with russian culture and what do the local russians think about it yeah well the, the you know that phrase american village that was actually something that uh you know that the yaroslav government was talking about and i i thought it was i thought it was kind of funny and i liked it but okay. you know in practice you know I actually have multiple Russian neighbors before you get to the first American neighbor. And so there's Russians all in this area, you know, uh, e even the church where I serve. Yes, there's multiple Americans there and we can talk to each other in English and I do part of the liturgy in English, but there's also a bunch of Russians there and I do most of the liturgy in church Slavonic. So right. uh, it's a mix, which I think is good yeah. because we need to learn Russian. We need to interface mm -hmm. uh, with Russian society. That's very important, but I can also say, having lived here almost six years, uh, just for your own personal sanity, sometimes, you know, sort of like that old dumb song, you, you know, you need to go where everybody knows your name, you know, yeah. uh, sometimes you just need to talk to somebody that came from where you're from, you know, you yeah. just need to talk to somebody with a similar background, a similar language, and so it helps, it really helps to have both, it helps to have godly Orthodox Russians to talk to and to visit with, but it also really helps to have these American families within five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 right. minutes that you can say, hey, you know, I, I need to hear some English for a change. Let me have you over for, you know, let's grill some, let's grill some sausages on the grill and, and talk English for a while. <laughs> so it's not what I would call like the Yankee mindset where people move there and, oh, everybody has to change because now I'm here now, this glorious, no, um, no. Um, ugly American, right? It's not people all. who move there because they appreciate it, but sometimes need to hear somebody from back home you know, encouragement from them. Yeah, it's people who together. genuinely <laughs> love Russia. It's people yeah. who genuinely want to learn Russian and get to know uh, Russian society. But, you know, it's sort of like comfort food. Sometimes yeah. you, you still, sometimes, no matter how much Russian you learn, sometimes it still is just nice to talk yeah. to somebody from back home. <laughs> exactly. So um, I had been familiar with you for a few years and I uh, reached out to you in the late spring of 2020 
uh, somebody uh, who would be a good resource, this was a long time ago, about possibly my family and I fleeing. We've thought about going all mm -hmm. sorts of places over the years. Chile was one of them, Colombia, just down to Mexico. But anyway, as we became Orthodox Christians. We've got we were, land here for you. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I mean. And, and, and tell your sons, I have five eligible daughters. So there you go. There, there you go. That is one of my concerns. <laughs> definitely raising sons here in such a feminized um, mm -hmm. culture. But, uh, <laughs> um, and I could have, you, you remember this conversation. I would have gotten on a plane in May or June 2020 and mm -hmm. gone with us and our German Shepherd. That's another one of the things we got to figure out how to get our dog there if we were to go to even visit for three years or to move. But, you know, they, they weren't letting in Americans because of the coup or whatever. And mm -hmm. then we talked to you, my husband and I, on a video call back, I think it was earlier this year. So my family's always like the, 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 the pull and push of endure or flee. Do we endure? Mm -hmm. Is God opening a door here and closing one there? Like we're constantly like not knowing what to do. Now we're yeah. like part of a mission here and we're, you yeah. know, we got a building, but it's one of those things that, you know, um, just say one of my sons wanted to go there and live for a few years. You know, I love the fact that there's an option and mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, I think it's everybody's called, you know, to serve God god's purposes in different places sometimes you do stay and endure and build and try to make beauty from the ashes and then sometimes you flee i mean you know i think mm -hmm. of my ancestry uh scottish ancestors welsh ancestors um and then i'm a quarter lebanese so at some point all those people had to leave where they're from and come to the united states so mm -hmm. um tell us a little bit about your article that you did just read about that you did just write about escaping America when God says to flee. So when we know what, what it was for you, the, um, I guess the, the straw that broke the camel's back, but what is your advice to other people as far as fleeing goes? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, the first thing is just, you know, recognizing reality. So some people, you know, maybe you just have absolutely no money whatsoever. Uh, does that make it impossible to move? No, but it makes it a lot more difficult. You know, um, unfortunately, it costs money for plane tickets. It costs money for visas. Uh, once you arrive, uh, if you don't have a work visa and you don't speak Russian, you know, how are you going to get a job to make money? There's just practical considerations that for some people, uh, it's not that they don't want to. It's that in their current situation, they just can't. And so you just have to realize that's where a person is at that particular time. And so for somebody like that, it's not really a matter of uh, what, do I want to badly enough or do I not want to badly enough? You know, maybe they're just not in a place where they can yet. Or maybe, maybe you have a spouse, you know, a particular spouse really wants to move, but, but the, the other spouse is just absolutely unwilling, you know. Okay, are you going to move to Russia and cause a divorce? Well, uh, yeah, that's probably not a good idea. You know, right. probably you know, divorce is a bad enough thing that we need to avoid that. Um, so that, and, and you know, in other situations, let's say you have a priest who uh, the bishop has assigned to a particular parish, and maybe he sees mm -hmm. all the signs, he sees the dangers, but in obedience to his bishop, he just continues to lead that church, even though if he were not under a bishop. Uh, he might take his family and, and move to Russia. So I think we have to be, you know, realistic and compassionate to the different situations that people are in. But what about that subset? You know, what about the subset of people that, you know, there's no, you know, there's no bishop ordering them, you know, you must stay, I'm ordering you to, you know, I'm ordering you to do this. Um, we may not be independently wealthy or rich, but we have enough money where, yeah, okay, we could get, uh, you know, we could get uh, visas, you know, we can get passports, we can get visas, we could live for a while before we start making an income in Russia, it's possible. Then, you know, in that kind of situation, I think they should, you know, really seriously consider it. And um, it's such a big move. How do you tell anybody, you must move now? You know, how do you do that? You can't. Uh, but what you can do is say, you must consider now. You must start thinking about it now. And I, I would say that. I think people should start thinking about it. People should really start considering it. Because um, it's like I said earlier, Sodom was a city. 
now, today, Sodom is a whole continent. Hmm. And I really mean that literally. Sodom has become the whole continent. The United States of America, you know, look a few years back when Obama had the LGBT rainbow flag projected on the White House. You know, that's America now. Uh -huh. That is, that's America. Are there exceptions? Of course there are. But, but I told you about the, the recent stats. They're getting worse, not better. You have 71%. That's a huge majority. 71% of Americans that are saying, yeah, I think, I think we should have, I think we should have homosexual marriage. Um, you know, how much worse does it have to get before God is going to judge America? You know, who was it? I forget who it was years ago said, you know, if God does not judge America, at some point he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. All right. <laughs> uh, it, I think we should take these things seriously. You know, God does judge nations. He does. Right. Uh, and, and even within our Orthodox Christian tradition, St. Paisios, a number of years ago, St. Paisios said, if an individual man sins, then God will judge the individual. But if the highest leaders of a nation sin, if the entire nation as a whole sins, then God's judgment will come upon the entire nation. Now that's St. Paisios. You know, he's well-loved, well-respected by Orthodox Christians worldwide, whether they're Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, everybody loves St. Paisios. And, and uh, you know, I've been to his grave multiple times. I've gone to Greece. I've gone to pray um i've been at the grave of saint paisios i even got a little bit of tiny bit of dirt from his grave and put it in a little reliquary and brought it home to put my you know put my icon corner and you know i can't forget his warning you know when a nation sins at the highest level when the leaders of the nation sin god's judgment will come on the whole nation and nothing would make me happier than to see america repent to see america say God forgive us, we've sinned, this is a great abomination, we must get rid of this homosexual garbage and, and we must repent. I would love that, I want to see that. Sadly, I do not see any indications whatsoever that it's going in that direction. And so let's assume that judgment comes. What does that look like? What does it look like when the judgment of God comes? Um, you know, you read, you read the saints of the late uh, 19th century. You read uh, Theophan the Recluse. Um, hold on just one second. <laughs> Sorry about that. You're a family somebody, man. <laughs> yeah, has somebody at the door. So that's life, right? Well, well so anyway, you know, so what were we the... talking about? the doubling oh, yeah, down of america so it's not just sodomy anymore it's transsexualism and um you know whatever the q and the a is and you know people wanting to marry their dogs and chop off their boobs and do all these other things exactly. I mean, it is the absolute um <laughs> you know i mean history will look back on this and say my goodness i we can't believe those people let this go on for so long, you know, or that they let it happen at all. But, you know, it's just this train barreling down the track and, you know, straight to nihilism, you know. So um, let me, with the few minutes we have left, talk about the the man on the street and what they think of mm -hmm. the, the war with Ukraine, with the West, with NATO, however you want to say it. And, you know, Steve Turley calls it the civilizational world order that is going to rise from the ashes and it's going to take down wokeism. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And maybe talk about like Putin's speech about how he sees uh, this as an existential thing within this uh, spiritual like ethos you've been talking about. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, if, if the thing about propaganda is if the only thing you hear is propaganda, if the only thing you hear is lies, then it can sound plausible. It can sound real. Uh, but it's amazing how even just a little bit of the truth, just a willingness um, to step outside the, the media sources that you've been addicted to, if the only thing you're listening to is American news, Western news, you know, Western European news, if you just simply step out of that and say, wait a minute, 
um, you know, how many people in America agree that they're lying to us? They're full of propaganda. They're, they're telling all these lies. They're hiding stuff from us. Uh, it's, you know, you can find tens of millions of Americans right now uh, who agree with that. Most of them in red state. Uh, the the media is lying. The media is covering things up. Uh, they're trying to shut people up. Well, do you think that the American media suddenly got virtuous? Right. Do you think that Western European media suddenly got virtuous when it came to this war? You know, suddenly Biden and, you know, Macron and, uh, and the leaders of all these uh, Western European nations and uh, Trudeau, do we really think that suddenly they all became uh, blood-bought, born-again Christians full of the Holy Spirit and that they're only doing what is virtuous? Uh, of course not. And so we just have to ask, is it possible that they're lying to us about this too? Well, of course it is. Of course it is. In fact, I would say the fact that uh, the leaders of America and Canada and virtually all the Western European nations are in agreement about something is evidence that it's a lie. <laughs> Good red flag, the, right? <laughs> the huge red flag. You know, anything that Biden and Trudeau and the Western European leaders agree on has got to be garbage. It's got to be a lie. So the fact that they all hate Putin, that's my first reason for loving him. <laughs> <laughs> that's all i need you know the fact that they and soros despise putin tells me that putin must be doing something right and so what's the next step if you say okay they're lying to us well what's the other side it's right there in the book of proverbs in the scriptures it says the first person to state his case sounds right but but then you hear the other side then you listen to the other person. You listen to the other person, and it's like, oh, wait a minute. Maybe, the, maybe that first guy wasn't right after all. Right. Well, and so what do you do? You look at the other news, and there's a lot of it out there. Unfortunately, uh, the West is blocking a lot of it. In, in the West, if you don't have a VPN or a friend that knows what's going on, uh, you're not even going to hear the truth. You're not even going to hear the other side. And, and again, that's one of the reasons that we have these websites. That's right. why I tell people, Go to Global Orthodox, that G Orthodox uh, news website. Go to Russian Faith, uh, the Substack that I just created, the Moving to Russia. I put I put a number of things on there. Uh, you know, people can send me a Telegram. People can send me an email, and just say, I want to know the other side. I haven't decided yet, but I want to hear the other side. Well, I've got a whole list of things I'll just send you, and you can look at it. And there are you know there are video after video. I personally. One example, I personally have interviewed uh, multiple families who are refugees from Ukraine. I've talked to them face to face. And what they tell me is not that Russians are aggressive and that Russians are coming there and oppressing people and killing people and raping people. Multiple families that I have met myself and have talked to have told me that for the past eight years, uh, the Western Ukrainians have been bombing and shelling and killing uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of people in Eastern Ukraine. And that for eight years, they've just been praying for so something to bring that to an end, for something to, you know, something to happen so that this will stop. And Putin tried. He tried every diplomatic means under the sun to make that come to a peaceful end. And the West refused to cooperate. Ukraine, you've refused to cooperate. The Western nations, America, they refused to cooperate. And so finally, what did Putin do? He finally came not to start a war. All right, you had said um, uh, Putin didn't come to start the war, but what? Exactly, Putin did not come to start the war. The war had already been going on for eight years. So Putin simply came to finish the war, to put it into it so that there would be peace. Uh, recently, I actually got to talk with uh, three uh, refugee families that had come from Ukraine very recently, just within the past couple of months. And it was really eye-opening to sit down with them and talk to them face-to-face -face and ask them what's going on. Uh, they didn't have a sense that, you know, that Russia was being an aggressor. They didn't have a sense that they were doing something bad. They had had sleepless nights and fear for eight years from all of these, you know, the shelling and the killing that had been happening already within Ukraine. Um, and for them, it was a relief, you know, it was a relief to come to Russia and, uh, and to finally feel safe, to feel like 
you know, the Russian military had not attacked them. The Russian military was there to, to defend them. And to see these moms and dads and these children and to hear them say these things, you know, to, to tell the stories themselves, it really, it really made it real, real to me. And uh, the, the average Russian, are they, what, what's their take? You know, do they see Putin as a warmonger or do they see uh, his point that NATO is being pushed up to the doorstep and that he had tried diplomacy and, you know, <laughs> it's being stopped by Boris Johnson, whoever, you know, that it's, it's just not, it seems, again, totalitarian it, that Russia have to, has to give 100% and the West gets everything. So, I mean, do, does the average Russian see that or are they swayed by Western media? I do run into a handful of Russians who are, you know, who, who oppose what's going on and who are not in agreement with it. But my opinion, most of the people that I've met, it seems like the majority is is very supportive you know they support their president they support uh the russian military and you know and, and they realize that we're being faced with a very great evil that's trying to destroy us in russia uh the west is not content simply to let us to let us be yeah. to let us live in peace um they're determined that we will submit to their economic demands that we will become woke just like they are that we will uh, you know, we'll have uh, sodomy and gay marriage and all these different things the same way that they have. And because we reject those things, uh, they, they want to destroy us. They, they want to, you know, they publicly, they have, you know, publicly stated that they want to see Russia dismantled and turned into a whole bunch of separate yeah. uh, republics. And so, you know, they've been very open and honest about it. I, I will give them that. They have told us you know, Russia, we don't want you to exist anymore. We want yeah. to destroy you. We want to take your president out. You know, we want him out of power. And so, you know, if they've made their intentions known, uh, it's not surprising that Russia is going to defend its interests and defend its people. It's interesting, the, the state of the world, you know, at my core, I'm kind of, you know, a live and let live kind of person, right? You know, that's kind of the, sure. like, the, the the southern way you know sweep your own doorstep try not to meddle in other people's business but those days are mm -hmm. gone that's what i try to tell to my southern compatriots yeah. and you know you had said they don't want putin and russia to exist and this is what i would tell what i do tell people who don't make that connection that the same war that's being um waged upon normal americans god-fearing americans mm -hmm. conservative you know pro-traditional quote unquote, normal people, um, is they hate you and want you dead, right? And you had said that, Absolutely. you know, it is an existential thing. And it's not that they want you to just conform. It's that if you do not abide the totalitarian thing we've been talking about, you, they want you dead. So this is just that playing out on a grand scale. Um, are, are people starting to see that, especially after the uh, terrorist attack on the bridge, which was people... In the West, we're applauding it and thinking how great it was and making funny memes about, you know, people, um, you know, innocent civilians dying on the bridge. But I thought we were supposed to be fighting for democracy to save human lives. You know, I think, you know, some people in the West are starting to see the bipolar nature of the things that we're being told and we're supposed to believe. Are Russians seeing that too? You know, perhaps ones that were not, you know, on the pro-Putin bandwagon, for lack of a better way to say it. Yeah, absolutely. I'd say a very large number of Russians, I'd say the majority of Russians are are in agreement. This is not just, this is not just political. It's not just another war, you know, if there is such a thing. Uh, this is spiritual. You know, this is literally the forces of light versus the for forces of darkness and the Russian military. That's the forces of light. They are literally, you know, they're doing God's work. They are fighting for something that is good and pure and clean and holy. And yeah, I kid you not, you look at uh, a number of the photos, not taken by the West, but a number of the photos of the actual, you know, Russian military, you know, they, they'll actually take like banners of Christ, you know, they will take, uh, uh, you know, they're taking crosses there. Um, these are men, a lot of these, uh, not all of them, but a lot of these soldiers are men of faith. These are, 
uh, godly, God-fearing Orthodox Christians that are willing to fight for a good cause, a lot of these men. And meanwhile, uh, I don't know how much of this has been seen in America, I'm going to guess not very much, but meanwhile in Ukraine, uh, you have a whole lot of the military, especially in the leadership, who are uh, you know, intentionally turning their backs on Christianity altogether. There are these, uh, you know, viral videos that they have sent all around Ukraine, uh, talking as if the, the ancient Slavic pagan gods have come back and they're thirsting for Russian blood and, you know, just these really, really shocking, you know, pretty disgusting videos and ideas that they've come up with. Uh, a number of the Ukrainian military uh, are actually wearing swastikas and other and other paraphernalia and symbols that were very popular in Nazi Germany. And um, they've even found a number of places in Ukraine where they actually would have like a shrine to Hitler with an actual photo of Hitler and very bizarre, you know, very bizarre, just as far away from Christianity as you can possibly get. Um, you know, me meanwhile, you know, meanwhile, you have uh, a lot of the Russian military that, uh, you know, they're very self-consciously Orthodox Christians, and they're trying to go there, not to hurt Ukraine, not to destroy Ukraine. You know, if the goal was to destroy Ukraine, Russia would have done that on week number one. Right. Russia has the power to mow Ukraine down and leave nothing left. If if Russia wanted to have a shock and awe, you know, like America did when it mercilessly killed thousands of civilians bombing Baghdad and Iraq for mm -hmm. nonstop for three days. Russia has the firepower to do it. The reason Russia has moved so slowly is because they're doing this not to hurt people, not to hurt civilians, but to weed out the Nazis, to weed out the, the godless people that are that have been shooting at their own people for over eight years. They're trying to weed these people out. And, uh, you know, even recently when in uh, retaliation for the, you know, for the bombing of the Crimea Bridge, uh, when Russia bombed the entire nation, uh, it was, it was very surgical. They were intentionally aiming for the power stations all over the country. And, uh, you know, I support what Russia is doing. I, I've looked at the videos, I've looked at the news, and I've not only looked at Eastern news or Western news, I've looked at both sides. And you know anybody that's only seen what American news sources or Western European news sources have said, I would just urge you, you know, before you come to this conclusion that it's a good thing to blow up the Crimea Bridge, uh, why don't you get the other 50% of the news that you've not been listening to and, and mm -hmm. reach out and find those sources and actually look at the rest of the information? Yeah, the, the Russophobia that uh, was just <laughs> came to the fore last February and March I was shocked by it. I mean, I was really, really shocked by it. The the amount of hatred from so many people who just hate Russia. Some of them have historical reasons, other ones because they still think they're commies. Just this bizarre kind of comical, I don't know, not comical, but like comic book almost um, mm -hmm. foil. And, you know, again, I try to make this connection to Southern Americans that the same reason southern americans specifically white straight southern men are hated is because they see them as a thorn in the side of the yankee empire the empire the globo homo big um blob mm -hmm. that it is and that's because they they typically push back and have been a christian resistance um to this thing right the yankee empire the um the, the the tyranny totalitarian tyranny industrial capitalism blah 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 and then it leads us to the wokeness i you know and i see that as an exact parallel to why they hate russia and putin because he's the foil he's the thorn in the side so you have to demean and you know really i mean a hateful thing like use genocidal language almost mm -hmm. to talk about him and russians was that shocking to you i mean it shocked me for maybe like a week. And then I was like, okay, I guess this is just the same thing. You know, it's the same political theater. It's just like a different cast of characters. Uh, did it shock you? I mean, it was pretty over the top. Uh, did, 
Which thing shocked me? Just you, you mean just the way they talk about Putin yeah, in the media? Yeah, the Russophobia and how like it was like a a tidal wave. And I guess, you know, maybe I saw it more than you did because I'm living outside of Russia, but it was a tidal wave. I mean, it was bizarre how quickly people decided they hated Russia. And, you know, every, you know, from the Simpsons to, you know, billboards to everything was just adamantly like, if you're a good American, you must hate Vladimir Putin and hate Russia. Did you see um, any of that like from afar or were there people there like, um, kind of beating that drum as well that oh you know we're to blame that kind of thing yeah i had not seen a lot of that there was a, a small amount of protesting again there's a there's a, a, a small minority of people here in russia that are like that but the vast majority here um you know they're they're on board with what russia is doing they they better than you know better than anybody in the west i mean seriously six months ago or let's say nine months ago uh most of the people in america couldn't even point to ukraine on a map and i bet you most of them can't now <laughs> mm -hmm. um you know there are exceptions but most americans in my experience are not that uh you know not that well educated on anything outside their own borders so you know if you'd ask them where is ukraine well, i don't know, you know who, who's running it i don't know right um meanwhile of uh, huge millions of russians have uh, cousins, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles living in Ukraine. <laughs> so, you know, they're talking to people in Ukraine, mm -hmm. you know, every week, their family. Um, and, and so people here, they really do know what's going on there. Uh, millions of people here, you know, millions of people there, and they can just pick up the phone and know what's going on in Ukraine because that's where their family lives. And so the people here, they understand what their family members have been subjected to over the past eight years. Uh, they know how America and West and Soros's money came together to overthrow a legitimate government in Ukraine in 2014, in Euromaidan, and and how and how that new illegitimate government has mercilessly shelled and killed uh, over 14,000 people in eastern Ukraine over the past eight years. And you know, so they were ready for that to stop. They were ready for that to end. And so when Russia finally said, "Look," Every diplomatic approach has failed. Uh, Ukraine, America, Western Europe has refused to do anything about it. It's just getting worse. Uh, okay, we're going to stop it. We're going to end it now. First of all, for those millions of Russians, those Russian people that live in Eastern Ukraine that don't deserve to be shelled and killed every day. Uh, and second, because as the Ukrainian military kept growing in strength, growing in strength, growing in strength, um, you know, they had plenty of evidence showing that Ukraine was planning on doing this anyway. They were planning on invading Crimea and even other portions of Russia. And so uh, it, it's, it's every bit, not only in Russia's right, but in Russia's responsibility mm -hmm. to, to defend its people, whether they happen to live within Russia's borders or whether they happened to be living in Ukraine, uh, they had a responsibility to defend their people and to mm -hmm. say, you know, you have to stop shooting at us. You can't keep doing that. And most Russian people, as far as I can tell, they they understand that. Well, last question, because we have a little extra time since we're doing this um, last recording, is uh, how the Orthodox Church plays into this. Because before February 2022, I would try to explain to my conservative Protestant friends how um, Orthodoxy is trying to be... Um, there are powers that be the CIA and such trying to undercut orthodoxy because they see it again as a thorn in the mm -hmm. side globally of um, the, the wokeism and the totalitarianism, uh, the new world order, all that kind of thing. Um, the new world religion, the new age religion. Uh, you know, can you explain to listeners uh, what is happening orthodoxy wise in Ukraine and what the Russian church what their take on it is um as far as the geopolitical stuff goes yeah absolutely so um it, it's really interesting there's a number of orthodox saints who have actually predicted a whole lot of the things that are happening now so i believe one of them was saint uh, lawrence of chernogov uh, back in the 1940s and uh anyway he predicted with quite a bit of detail uh some of the 
the really bad things that would be happening today in Ukraine. And I don't have the time to go through it, but you know, go online, you know, look look up uh, Orthodox prophecies on on Ukraine. Uh, you know, also there's this uh, podcast called uh, World War Now that's out. Uh, they they get into a lot of these prophecies as well, and it's really interesting. Uh, even before any of this happened, you have Orthodox saints writing that these things were going to be happening and that they would be happening in Ukraine. So that's fascinating. Uh, another fascinating thing is uh, much older, St. Cosmos of Aetolia, a Greek Orthodox saint from 300 years ago, back in the 1700s. Uh, he predicted that before the very end, that a full half of the orthodox jurisdictions would fall away you know this is a pretty dark prophecy pretty sad now the encouraging thing is that the other half don't so you know let's be part of the half that don't fall away but you know a thousand years ago uh you know before a thousand years ago even rome was uh, part of the orthodox church you know the, the roman pope the roman patriarch was orthodox church and then that fell away well today there's approximately 14 orthodox you know major jurisdictions in the world like greek orthodox russian orthodox romanian orthodox and so on and so think about that you know if we believe this prophecy by saint cosmos uh, that means that about seven of those are going to fall away and that's a pretty dark scary thing uh it seems like maybe we're already seeing the first you know the first hints of that um you know, it's easy for us to say, oh, America hates orthodoxy, America's anti-orthodox. It's not quite true, not quite true. Um, America and the Globo Homo, they despise and they hate um, devout orthodox. They hate orthodox Christians who actually try to follow Christ and to obey the commandments of Christ and to follow the teachings of the orthodox church. So devout orthodox, Absolutely, America hates them. But the American government loves Patriarch Bartholomew and the Greek Orthodox Church uh, and Archbishop Elpidophoros there in America. Uh, America and the U.S. State Department love uh, the Patriarch of Alexandria, who has sided with Patriarch Bartholomew. And so, and, and so what do you have here? I mean, we could spend hours just talking about these two characters, but just in a nutshell, you know, we'll just pick on uh, Patriarch Bartholomew and, and also, uh, you know, his lackey, Elpidophoros, the Archbishop of the Greek Church in America. Um, you know, one of the most vile, heretical, anti-Orthodox documents that I've ever seen in my life uh, came from Elpidophorus's hand in reference to Patriarch Bartholomew. And this is a couple of years ago when he put out this document saying that Patriarch Bartholomew, the Patriarch of Constantinople, is not the first among equals. He's the first without equal. Hmm. So all Orthodox in the world basically must bow to him and be obedient to him. So that, so basically, he's making a claim for himself that is even more audacious, even more heretical than what the Pope of Rome did a thousand years ago. You know, primus inter pares, first among equals. Um, you know, Rome has been able to twist that for a thousand years into this idea of a universal supremacy over the whole church. Uh, Bartholomew is saying, first, first among equals, nothing. I'm first without equal. Right. <laughs> I'm above everybody. Everybody has to obey me. Uh, for 300 years, the churches in Ukraine have been under the uh, Patriarch of Moscow, the Patriarch of Russia. Uh, but because this irrelevant Greek bishop over in the Middle East somewhere with hardly any parishioners left there in the Middle East where he is, uh, he decides, you know what? I'm in charge there now, and Patriarch Kirill, you're not in charge. I'm just going to write this document. Okay, poof, now I'm in charge. You know, maybe that's how the Pope of Rome does things. That's not how Orthodoxy does things. Right. That's full-blown heresy. That's false teaching. That's not Orthodox. And that's just a drop in the bucket. I mean, what do you do with Elpidophoros marching in Black Lives Matter parades? What do you do with Elpidophoros uh, recently in the news? You know, the abomination. He flew to Greece 
and he uh in public in a church in a greek orthodox church he performed a baptism of two children that had been created through surrogacy to be the children of uh, two men two sodomite men in a homosexual marriage you know, this is not orthodox this this is exact this is globo homo it's globo homo in orthodox robes and why do i bring this up it's to say you know you asked where are these things in orthodoxy well there's two orthodoxies now you know there's faithful devout orthodoxy that says marriage is between one man and one woman uh, there's faithful devout orthodoxy that says you know, if we baptize children, it's, they have to be children of faithful Orthodox Christians, you know, not people that are sodomites pretending to be married. Um, uh, Orthodox Christians that are devout do not claim uh, that somebody has the power of a Roman Pope. Uh, right. These are not Orthodox things. And, and so you have two Orthodoxies. You have Orthodoxy that is fighting for Orthodoxy, which would include Russia, and, and Serbia and some of these other jurisdictions. And then you have, sadly, the Patriarch of Constantinople, Patriarch of Alexandria, um, and also I'll include Archbishop Elpidophorus of the Greek Orthodox Church in America that are just firmly coming down on the side of uh, debauchery, heresy, full-blown you know, public sin, public uh, anti-Orthodox. And the U.S. is not blatantly blanket anti-orthodox the u.s state department uh even the president himself uh, president joe biden recently welcomed patriarch of alexandria to the white house mm -hmm. and met with him face to face that was just this um, week right yeah just this past week and a, a representative of the u.s state department went to go see patriarch bartholomew just this right. past week and those ties go back for several years you know there have been years of contact between the U.S. State Department and Patriarch Bartholomew. It's been going on for, for several years. I mean, Mike Pem Pompeo is supposedly Greek Orthodox, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so there's really two orthodoxies. And so the, the debauched, uh, wicked, apostate side orthodoxy mm -hmm. uh, that is in the process of breaking away from the rest of the church, the break hasn't fully happened yet. It's still in, you know, in process. Um, that that side is where America is siding with them. So if you're on that side of the Orthodox mm -hmm. Church, if you're siding with those people, um, you'll get inv invitations to the White House. You will get invitations from the U.S. State Department. You'll be in good with them. It's only if you're on the side of Orthodoxy that is to holding the line to the ancient faith that was passed down once to the saints. That's the side of Orthodoxy that America wants to destroy. And it ties directly in with these 300 year old prophecies from St. Cosmos of Atolia, who was Greek Orthodox himself, that the day is coming when half of the Orthodox jurisdictions are going to fall away. And it's sad, it, it makes me sick to my stomach, but I think that's what we're in the process of seeing happen now. Yeah, and the apostate Orthodoxy, as you call it, um, is very well funded um mm -hmm. run the institutions get ngo money governmental money and these are the people that want their academic freedom right they get so upset oh they get their freedom but all they do with their academic freedom is call people like me and you fascists so it's very uh mm -hmm. <laughs> interesting and i don't know if you know this but here in rokor um the russian orthodox church outside russia within the united states um there were letters like anonymous letters sent to priests of Rokor parishes um, asking them to, this was back in February, you know, denounce the war, denounce Putin, stop um, um, commemorating Patriarch Kirill, you know, um, in the Polychron and at the, at the end of the, the, the liturgy. And, uh, you know, it was, the pressure was on for a while and I'm not saying yeah. it's not still there, but um I don't know what's going to happen to people who are within, um, you know, Russian Orthodox mm -hmm. in the United States, converts or not, you know, um, it's going to be very mm -hmm. interesting to see what happens. Well, and that's one of the reasons it kind of circles back around, you know, why did my family leave and why should other families in America at least consider it, you know, at least consider it. Mm -hmm. And even if you yourself are not Russian, even if you don't speak a word of Russian, maybe you're just uh, an American mom and dad with three or four kids 
and you've become Orthodox Christians and you just want to be faithful. And because you want to be faithful to the Orthodox uh, Christian faith, um, you don't want to go to one of these woke Orthodox churches where they play around with homosexuality and they play around with these, you know, papal pretensions. And so you find yourself in a Russian Orthodox church, like Rokor. And, you know, if this, if these, you know, we've already seen uh, attacks on Russian embassies, we've seen attacks on Russian churches in America, in Canada, in Western mm -hmm. Europe. Um, if, if things keep escalating, if things keep getting worse, um, it may really get to the point that if you want to go to a good, clean, uh, right teaching Orthodox church, you're going to have to put your family in danger just to go to that church because people are going to attack you just because you're in that church. And for that reason, if you value your family's safety, it's at least worth considering. It's at least worth saying, look, um, do I want to worship according to the true faith in a church where my family is going to be in physical danger because people hate Russians? Or would I like to go to a place where every church is Russian Orthodox and it's perfectly normal and safe to be there because it's Russia? <laughs> yeah. And the flip side of me wanting to stay and dig in my heels is um, not only is this my home, but I want to spread the faith here. Absolutely. And I think that's why the, um, the uh, intelligentsia, as I guess we'll call them, even though they're not intelligent, uh, they're <laughs> so frazzled by the number of converts to orthodoxy, specifically very conservative orthodoxy, yes. not the apostate kind, um, because this was not part of the game plan. Um, so, of course, they have to say, you know, white supremacist, Nazi, whatever they call us, you know, stupid sure. yahoos, but um, that people in America who want to have a relationship with Christ are desperate for authenticity yes. and they're finding it in the Orthodox church. So that's a good reason to stay, but yes, you are exactly mm -hmm. right. Smack dab in the middle of those crosshairs. I mean, there's no two yeah. ways about it. <laughs> well, and here's the thing. I think it's perfectly commendable and good for people to stay, uh, but only if they stay with their eyes open. Yeah. If people stay just because they don't want to deal with it, they don't want to think about it. I just want to put my head in the sand and just, hey, life's going to keep going and everything's going to be fine. You're going to be in great danger and you're not going to be protecting your wife and your children. Yes. And that's not good. So if you're going to stay, if you're going to make that conscious decision, then make real concrete plans. Okay. When things get worse, when I am put in physical danger, when my wife and my little children are putting physical danger because we're in a Russian Orthodox church or because I happen to agree with Putin on something or because I like Patriarch Carol, um, what am I going to do to protect my family? Mm -hmm. That's an important question to ask. You know, if you're going to stay, you at least need to stay with your eyes open and have a real game plan to say, look, I'm staying, but I'm counting the cost. I know what the danger is, and I'm preparing for it in some concrete way. Yes. Well, Father, it has been a pleasure speaking to you. Uh, I hope to meet you in person someday in Russia. Of course, you're, if you're ever in the United States again, come down to North Carolina and give us a visit. But um, whether it's as visitors or something else, I do hope to see you sometime in the next few years. And thank you for everything you do. I mean, you are a very hardworking man. So the fact you made time for me to have this conversation today, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. And I really appreciate your, your podcast as well. And I hope you'll keep up the good work. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, have a wonderful weekend and I hope to see you soon. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.